Thank you all for coming out today. I'm very excited to be here to introduce one of the city's first piece of legislation that will really help Detroit become a healthier and cleaner city and really help us improve our air quality in the city of Detroit. I'm here to talk about a piece of legislation that my office has been working on for over three years. Uh, when I was first elected, some of you may um, remember back in 2013 that there were piles of, of, of black material being stored along the riverfront. Um, we came to find out that that was a material known as pet coke um, and that there was many f harmful uh, impacts that that material could have on the surrounding neighborhoods and residents. So the, that was the initial kind of impetus for the legislation um, back in 2014. And since then, we've come to realize there's quite a few other implications from pet coke, but also other materials in our communities. So this piece of legislation would address two major issues that, that impact our air quality in the city of Detroit. The first is uh, the regulation is of storage and transportation of any carbonaceous material. So some of this is kind of um, jargon, but I'll explain it as best as possible. Be pet coke, met coke, coke breeze, etc. If you think of it, it really is any product that might come from the uh, production of coal, breaking down of coal. Uh, and those materials uh, can be broken down to, to very, very, very tiny par particles that essentially can enter the air and we may not see them. So not only, uh, as I mentioned earlier, does this create, these piles create an eyesore in our communities, but they also expose residents to harmful dust. And so the legislation would require that any carbonaceous materials be stored in a full enclosure. So to prevent them from blowing into our communities, to prevent them from negatively impacting the health of our residents, and to prevent them from creating eyesores along the riverfronts in our neighborhoods. So this full enclosure would have to have an impermeable floor. So what that means is that the materials could be stored in this building, but we had, would, it would guarantee that there wouldn't be any type of seepage into the soil and thereby into the waterways, which is really, really important. Um, the, le the legislation would also address another component, which sometimes we may not think about, but the city of Detroit is incredibly dusty. If you've ever gone out door knocking, and I do this on a daily basis, you can literally see inches of dust in some of our communities. Now that dust may, may, out, may um, activate our allergies or give us kind of a runny nose or, or runny eyes, but there's a different type of dust that's, a, that's even more dangerous that we cannot see. And we call it in this legislation fugitive dust. And that may seem like an odd term, but fugitive dust is dust that leaves these bulk solid material facilities. It's blown into neighboring houses. It's tracked into our communities by trucks, can seep into the waterways uh, carried by the rain. And so this smaller material, particulate matter, uh, you'll hear someone else talk about it later as PM10, that's not visible to the human eye, can enter the bloodstream, can enter our lungs, and can eventually lead to asthma, different types of respiratory infections and in the worst case scenarios can contribute to different types of cancer. And given Detroit's his history as a, an industrial city, this is the type of dust that um, has the greatest impact on many of our neighborhoods. And in many of the communities, there's a high concentration of these types of facilities. And it's these facilities, these facilities, these neighborhoods that stand to benefit the most from this type, this piece of legislation. Again, and so just to recap, that this legislation seeks to ultimately remove dust from our communities, harmful dust, to make sure that trucks are gonna be clean before they enter these neighborhoods. It would require facilities to have an aggressive street sweeping plan to make sure that dust isn't entering our neighborhoods. If a company decides to store carbonaceous materials, it have to be in a full enclosure. And so we've tried to work with industry for over the past three and a half years to come to a point of compromise so that um, monitors aren't going to be an over uh, a financial burden for the industry so that street sweeping and the fugitive dust plan that's required there's flexibility in how the company would implement that um, and that ultimately both the public health as well as the industry are able to thrive and that people are able to live in communities that have clean air so I can go into a little bit more specifics about the, the, the details of the legislation but now I'd like to turn it over to Nicholas Leonard from the Great Lakes Environmental Law Clinic to talk about some of the more scientific um, components of it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Castaneda Lopez. Good morning, everybody. My name is Nicholas Leonard, and I'm here today to voice my support for the Fugitive Dust Ordinance. Thank you. On behalf of the Great Lakes Environmental Law Center. 
we support this ordinance because we believe it represents a reasonable neighborhood-based solution to a neighborhood problem. In 2014, residents were shocked to see clouds of dust blowing from 50-foot high piles of pet coke into their homes and into their neighborhoods. However, what was particularly shocking was that in the aftermath of that event, many residents shared that this was not an isolated incident. Residents repeatedly shared stories about similar problems regarding other bulk solid material facilities. They shared stories about bulk solid material facilities that store pet coke, asphalt millings, limestone, steel slag, and other materials, and the dust that blows from those facilities onto their playgrounds and into their homes to the point where they are not sure whether the air is safe to breathe. They have told stories about kids missing school because of asthma attacks and dust keeping residents from enjoying a backyard barbecue. Detroit is not the only city that has confronted this issue. Many cities throughout the country have facilities like those that exist in Detroit that store construction and, and industrial aggregate materials in piles that are 50 feet or higher. A study commissioned by the city of Chicago found that facilities that store large quantities of construction and industrial materials such as pet coke can be a significant source of dust and can cause concentrations of particulate matter that are 32 times the federal ambient air quality standard, which is set at a level to be protective of public health. In short, this presents a public health concern. Even short-term increases in particulate matter pollution can ne negatively affect some of our most vulnerable residents. Scientific studies have linked particulate matter pollution to increased rates of respiratory-related hospital visits and the exacerbation of asthma, system, asthma symptoms amongst children. This is particularly concerning because the Michigan Department of Community Health has labeled Detroit the state's epicenter of asthma based on its findings that the rate of asthma-related hospitalizations in Detroit is three times the state average. To address this problem, many cities, including Chicago, have created their own solutions to ensure that neighboring residents that live nearby these facilities have clean air to breathe. Detroit is now trying to follow in the footsteps of these other cities that have addressed this important public health issue. After the pet coke incident, it has become clear that dust from bulk solid material facilities is underregulated by the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality. However, we cannot and should not wait for the Department of Environmental Quality to create a solution for a problem that is unique to Detroit. In Detroit, what residents need is this local ordinance that establishes neighborhood-based rules for a neighborhood problem. We know that bulk solid material facilities that exist in our neighborhoods can do better. By installing the proper technology, a facility can reduce its emissions from aggregate storage operations by as much as 90%. Similar to rules developed and implemented in Chicago, the ordinance would require Petco storage facilities to store that material in an enclosed structure to prevent similar incidents to the dust cloud that occurred a few years ago. Other facilities would be required to take some basic steps to controlling their dust, including installing spray systems to control dust from storage piles, installing a wheel wash, wheel wash systems for trucks leaving the facility, utilizing street sweepers, installing particulate matter and wind monitors to monitor dust emissions and weather data in real time. While the ordinance requires each facility to take some basic steps to control its dust, at the heart of this ordinance is the requirement that all facilities develop and submit a plan to the city of Detroit detailing how they will prevent dust from blowing from their facility into the homes of their neighboring residents. Further, if any facility feels that a particular requirement is overly burdensome or unnecessary to protect the public health, it can apply to the city for an exception or a variance. The hope is that industry, the city, and its residents can work together to ensure that all residents are being adequately protected while also ensuring that facilities aren't subjected to overly burdensome and costly regulations. The Great Lakes Environmental Law Center supports this ordinance because we think it is an effective neighborhood-based solution that will protect some of Detroit's children from dust blowing from bulk solid material facilities into their neighborhoods and into their homes. Thank you. Good morning, uh, my name is Stephanie Chang and I'm the state representative for House District 6. And uh, it's good to be here uh, today to talk about this really important ordinance. Uh, as you all remember in 2013, large black mountains of petroleum coke sat openly for months uh, on the banks of the Detroit River without any clear measures of preventing airborne particulates or water runoff. 
And last year, you probably remember the pile of coke breeze uh, that was sitting also near the river on a different facility. Petroleum coke, otherwise known as pet coke, is, as was mentioned earlier, a byproduct of refined tar sands and is characterized as being very similar to coal but is actually dirtier. Pet coke is carbon dense, which causes it to emit up to 10% more carbon dioxide than coal into the air. Fugitive dust and particulate matter have been linked to numerous health problems, as mentioned earlier, such as asthma, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, heart disease, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. The pet coke found in Detroit also contains two toxic metals, uh, selenium and vanadium. These chemicals had put our Great Lakes and our children's health at risk. So this ordinance is a really positive step. Uh, it would help to prevent future harmful effects of this type of substance, pet coke, coke breeze, or any other type of bulk solid carbonaceous material on our local communities by requiring that these substances be properly covered when piled up and when being transported to prevent airborne dust and water runoff into our waterways. It would go further and address violations and uh, fines as well. And I know that there have been numerous changes made to the ordinance since a month ago uh, to accommodate various concerns from industry leaders uh, and maintain the intent and effect of the ordinance, both to protect public health and our environmental quality. Earlier this year, during the spring, I in reintroduced a bill, uh, House Bill 4257 in the Michigan State House, to enact a few of the similar protections in this ordinance regarding bulk solid material. But I'm really, really glad to see this issue moving forward at the city council level. And the reality is, is that Detroit needs to follow Chicago's example and be the local leader here in Michigan. So I want to thank uh, Council Member Raquel Castaneda Lopez for introducing this ordinance and her leadership on this issue, and I uh, would urge the City Council to support it. Thank you. Um. So just to recap um, really quickly, that really the, the ultimate goal of this legislation is to improve air quality, to ensure that Detroiters have, are able to breathe clean air in their communities, and to, to really to clean up some of the past mistakes of industry in the past, working in partnership with industry to make sure that Detroiters continue to have jobs, but also that people are able to breathe clean air, and really recognizing that at a city moving forward, those must be at the fore, both must be at the forefront of our conversation as we talk about development. Um, so just to to recap, again, the legislation seeks to remove dust from communities, uh, seeks to make sure that trucks are clean before they enter into the communities, as, ra as well as rail cars, that they're tarped so that dust isn't blown and dragged into these neighborhoods. It seeks to make sure that industry also share some of the burden of sweeping the streets of their surrounding facilities so that the city is no longer solely footing the bill of sweeping the streets as well as cleaning the clogged drainage due to a lot of this dust and silt entering it into our water system. And ultimately, again, Again, to improve the quality of air for all Detroiters in the city of Detroit to make sure that every child and every family has ability to breathe. With that, that's it. Thank you so much, and I can take questions. So the question was how many average companies and the cost. So I think there's about a dozen more or less, depending spread throughout the city. Um, and, and there's a lot of flexibility in the legislation, so the cost can vary. Um, but we really worked with the health department as well as Great Lakes Environmental Law Clinic and industry to identify what would be the major expenses. One of the main concerns was around the monitoring. And so initially the legislation required that they had to be federally equivalent monitors, which can be in the hundreds of thousands. So we did some research and were able to identify different types of centers that capture the same type of data but are maybe a hundred or a couple hundred dollars. So depending on the types of monitors you choose to put in as a company, it could be as low as a couple hundred dollars to upwards of a couple hundred thousand depending on if you go with the federally equivalent monitors, FEM monitors. Um, as it relates to street sweeping, some of the facilities already provide street sweeping for how you sweep their own facilities. That again varies depending on whether your, your site is paved or unpaved. Street sweeping um, isn't necessarily required if BC will approve your fugitive dust plan, so it kind of just depends. Um, other potential costs would be the truck cleaning station. Again, it's not a requirement. The company can present a plan, and if it's approved by BC, they may not have to put in a, a truck cleaning facility. So it can range from maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars to upwards of a hundred thousand, really depending on what that company chooses to implement. So they have flexibility within the legislation. 
Sure. So one of the major components was the monitors, because that was a major concern that the FEM monitors would be, I, I think, roughly 250 to 300,000. So the compromise that the health department made, that my office made, was that you can now put in sensors. So the sensors would be installed still on all four sides of the facility. But again, as mentioned before, the sensors are maybe a couple hundred dollars, so much, much more affordable for the industry. Another major concern related to paving. So there wasn't a requirement before that sites would have to pave their yards. That was removed. So as long as you have a fugitive dust plan that involves street sweeping or some type of cleaning of trucks so that when the trucks are leaving, whether it's rumble strips, something like that, the main, again, the, the point is to reduce dust entering into these communities. So if you're able to accomplish that in a different way, you're not required to pave your facilities, you're not required to have a truck cleaning station, um, and you may not have to do street sweeping. It just all depends on your site. So each company has the flexibility to be able to implement. Uh, obviously, the building and safety and engineering department will approve that, um, but there's flexibility there. So another component was paving. I think the other major concern was one with the monitors, one was the paving component of it. Another issue was the pile height. So the pile height initially was restricted to um, 30 feet. Feedback we received recommended 50 feet. We were flexible in that. So in terms of it can be 50 feet, but that the surrounding uh, houses or surrounding buildings, you can't, you shouldn't be able to see it. So it would require more kind of buffering and landscaping on the outside. So again, the company has flexibility around how they decide to implement that. It's not a requirement that piles have to be 30 feet or higher, 30 feet or lower. You have flexibility on pile height, but it can't prevent a blight or eyesore within the community. So it has to be some level of screening for surrounding uh, uses. So the only site that, that I guess processes in, is in, in uh, transports uh, Pet Coke is, is Marathon. And actually, we worked closely with them to get an understanding of what they do. And so they're actually some of the leaders in the industry in terms of how they, they transport and handle Pet Coke. And so some of the pieces of legislation in here um, were developed on what their best practices are. But that's the only uh, site. There's other entities, I'm sure, that are interested in doing that. But at this point, no. Yep, yep. There is an opportunity to apply for a variance, and each company would go through that process and work with a building safety and engineering and environmental department to get that variance if they qualified. So it's up for a committee. It's been in, uh, it's been on back and forth in committee for well over three years now. This most amended version for the past month. It, the next discussion in committee will be Monday, July 10th, and we're hoping that it will be moved to formal for uh, scheduling of a public hearing, and ultimately that the public hearing would happen before July 25th, before we go on recess. Yes, yes, we have a copy of the new one that we can send out. Yeah. Any other questions? So I, and I can answer briefly on MDQ, but I'll ask Nick to chime in. Um, so really, if you think of MDQ kind of has broader statewide policies, and you think of city to city, Detroit may be um, Saugatuck or Muskegon or somewhere in the UP, have very different types of industries and, and concentrations of industries. So the kind of broader um, policies that they have at the statewide level may not really address the local concerns within the city of Detroit. And that's really why there's a need for local municipalities to kind of step up to be able to address these environmental and public health concerns. Do you want to add, Nick? And the only thing that I'll add is that the MDEQ is charged with regulating air quality throughout the state. And so its regulations that it creates will apply, like the council member said, to Saugatuck as well as to Detroit. The, but Detroit in this instance is a unique case because there are dozens of these types of facilities that exist in close proximity to, re to residents that are all clustered in certain neighborhoods, with, with Southwest being one of those neighborhoods. And so it, it really calls on the city of Detroit to create rules that govern that specific situation to make sure that its residents are being adequately protected from, from this issue. And it's something that the MDEQ um, can't it, it shouldn't and, and can't adequately regulate at the state level because it is a local issue. I mean, I would just echo what everyone else already said, but I do, you know, obviously it would be good to see um, 
um, some additional protections at the state level, which is why um, actually my predecessor, Rashida Tlaib, introduced legislation that um, is really more, it was more specific to just covering and uh, covering while both while the pile is sitting there and for transporting. And uh, we've made a few tweaks to the, to the bill since that. Um, but um, I think, like everyone said, um, you know, Detroit is in a unique situation, and so uh, I would. That's why I'm here today, is really to support this specific ordinance. Sure. I mean, I think as I go, I go on door knocking pretty frequently, and the stories that I hear door to door. So I think of Miss Griffin, who lives in the 48204 zip code, who talked to me about how often she has to go to the doctors, and that she has runny eyes and just clogged sinuses. And the doctor basically tells her each visit that this is due to the amount of dust and small dust in the community, and there's really not much we can do about it unless you decide to move. And so I think of of the. A mother in Delray who lost one of her, all of her children have asthma and she lost one of her daughters to cancer due to the concentration of industry and the particulate matter in, in that community. I think of the families in the 48217 in the Boynton neighborhood who have lived with, uh, surrounded by over 10 industries for decades and it's not, uh, all of these industries wouldn't be impacted by this piece of legislation, but it's their stories and the, and the struggles that they face on a daily basis really fighting um, for environmental justice and to improve their public health and quality of air. I mean, if, if we really want to talk about Detroit um, being a place where people can live, work, and play, you have to talk about air quality and how people can't even breathe in some, in some locations. Um, I, I see multiple people on oxygen tanks. And so the quality of air, I think, directly ties to quality of life. And so that's often our response is that the public health cost already is very high, that the city's costs, we're still trying to get the final numbers, but the city goes into these neighborhoods and sweeps the streets on a more frequent basis. They have to go in and unclog the basins on a more frequent basis um, because of the amount of dust and such that are filling up these, uh, this, these systems. And so there's already a cost that the city is burning, bearing. There's already a cost that the communities are bearing. There's already costs that individual families are bearing in terms of days of work that are lost as well as kids that are missing school because of the health implications of these, some of these industries. And th these are great companies. They've been in the city operating for over 100 years, some of them. Um, and it's just more a kind of lack of a, lack of knowledge or lack of awareness. So the city of Detroit was an industrial city. And when the city was designed, it didn't necessarily think about buffering space or air quality. I mean, people would go to work in, in facilities that were very harmful to their health. And thus, since then, we've learned quite a bit. So I think given that all of that we've learned and where we are now as a city and really trying to, um, again, making sure that every neighborhood uh, has a has a future and that every neighborhood and every resident has the ability to breathe clean air I think is an integral part of that. Sure. A lot of what we get back is the request to kind of just exempt them from the legislation. Ultimately, will kind of uh, make the legislation in ineffective. So that is why we've really worked to compromise to help lower the cost on lots of the different components. So it's not a punitive piece of legislation at all. It, it, it is more something that will help the city capture data on the concentrated types of emissions and dust happening in different communities so that we can adequately respond and support those communities uh, as it relates to uh, public health issues. And I'm not sure if anyone else wanted to add, but that ultimately is the goal. So we continue to push forward and continue to be open to getting um, feedback. Um, but at this point, I think both on, on our side as a city, we've gotten support from the health department. We've gotten support from the building and safety department. We've got well over 100 people signed on to a petition wanting to see this legislation move forward. Wayne County Exec Warren Evans have signed on. The Asthma Foundation has submitted a letter of support. Um, I think in all of those entities speak to uh, really highlighting the need for this type of legislation. And it really would be historic in that we really haven't done much as a city thus far to kind of rectify some of the wrongs that happened in the past um, and harmful things that happened when we are a much heavy industrial city. There, there are no penalties. So this is, a, as we're in, unlike other cities, there's no penalties per se. So what it is is that, so yes, if you, um, for example, don't sweep, sweep, your, sweep your streets and, and a neighbor calls in complaints. It's the same type of um, uh, fine that you may be issued or you may just be given a warrant for going out and, and sweeping your streets. But there's not a system of penalties built into the legislation. It really is more, again, a, a, as a way to create a process so that we can work with industry to be able to capture this data to ultimately improve air, uh, cleaner, air quality and make air cleaner in these neighborhoods. Or do you consider it as not having 
Oh, no. So although there's no penalties, it still creates a system, right? So companies have to submit a fugitive dust plan uh, that has to be approved by BCED. And without that, you can't, you can't necessarily begin operating. So there's a phasing in timeline for all existing companies, and all new companies would be required to meet these standards from the get-go. And so um, with that in place, we currently, and the MDQ as well, doesn't have very strong data on the type of particulate matters or concentrations of particulate matters at the localized level because of their, their policy are a bit broader. So that in of itself would be a huge step towards us really helping to clean up air and monitor different emissions. Um, the other component in terms of carbonaceous materials, currently there isn't really any regulation around that. So that in of itself also helps to create the, the processes for how people can um, have coke products in the city of Detroit and how they can store transport them as well in the city of Detroit. No, so if you wanted to store pet coke or met coke or copies, whatever it is, then you would have to build a full enclosure if you wanted to. If you choose not to, then yes, you would not be able to operate. The idea is that we want you here in the city, but you also need to be invested in protecting the public health for uh, of the surrounding communities. And that ultimately, it would be your decision whether you decided to pursue that or not. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs>